I think our planning system has become overly complicated and we seem to have a fear of mandating anything within planning. So we keep discretion open to the extent that it becomes very difficult for people to work out exactly what you're trying to achieve. And I'll use an example. If you look at the, the Melbourne planning scheme and you look at the front page, there are 72 different zones and overlays that cover the city. And then you think of cities you love, and Barcelona would be one. In Barcelona, when Serda set out the plan uh, for the extension of Barcelona, he determined the width of the streets, the size of the block so he could have a courtyard with an in internal courtyard to provide quiet enjoyment for the private rooms, and he determined a height of seven storeys. And what those few simple things did was create one of the best cities in the world with mixed use, very high densities, one of the densest cities in the world, and uh, the ability for it to adapt for residential, retail, commercial. We need to get back to that simplicity of vision. We need to understand what it is we're trying to get our planning system to deliver, rather than covering off every eventuality in some legalistic term that has now made the planning scheme, in my view, incomprehensible. We, we went into the modern movement with this idea of an overreaction to the industrial city where things like fog and smog and smoke, all the rest of it, were making it an unhealthy environment. And we, we start to segregate out the city into residential zones, shopping zones, industrial zones. We then took that and the city wasn't working and started to try and overlay on that philosophy different ways of working with the city, when what we should have done is actually thrown it out and gone back to first bases and said, what do we want the city to look like or feel like or operate like in 20, 30, 40 years' time? And if that's how we want it to operate, what do we need to put in place to make it operate like that? So if you take an example in Melbourne, if the areas of the city that you want to preserve, historic areas like East Melbourne, North Melbourne, parts of Carlton, that's a completely set, a different set of criteria to areas that you might want to become your key development areas. Yet we've lumped the whole lot in together. And we've just made it very difficult, I think, for the normal person to understand the outcome that we're expecting from this planning scheme. And I think the planners, in many cases, have lost that vision as well of what they expect this to look like. They're just covering every eventuality. There are five characteristics that make good cities. Uh, there's density. I think you need a certain number of people in a certain area to get vibrancy. Mixed use, uh, uh, because that enables you to share your infrastructure. Um, so what the uses at night can replicate you know, the parking used by day and therefore you don't have to replicate it. You need uh, good connectivity. You need to be able to walk there, ride there, catch public transport to it. You need a high quality public realm and this is the key. The space outside buildings is really where we live out our public life. And if we think about that more and say, how do we achieve great public spaces? And the largest component of public space in the city are the roads or the streets. They make up 80% of the public space. So in a way, if we design a good street, we design a good city. And if you stop and think about that, how difficult is that? We want, you know, reasonable footpaths, easy to walk on, shade in, in summer, you know, maybe sun in winter if we're lucky enough, uh, activity along the street that actually feeds that vibrancy back onto the street. So a high quality public realm is important. But then the other one is local character. So every place needs to be of that place, not a replication of some other city that you've seen elsewhere. If every city became generic, there'd be no point in traveling. So we try to capture the uniqueness of each individual place. So if you take those five things and say those, those are the things that we want to achieve in a good city, and then you look at your location and say, given the topography or you know, its local conditions, what would make a good city here? The, the rules and parameters around that are not difficult to uh, define in my view.
I think it's bigger than housing. Um, I think we need to uh, rethink the way we're growing our metro cities. Uh, and let me just explain that. So most of the capitals, capital cities of Australia, uh, if you look at a, a study done by Griffiths University called the Vampire Study, and it was about vulnerability to mortgage and petrol prices, what it showed between 2001 and 2006 was an increasing population on the fringe of our cities that was suffering under those two uh, characteristics. So in a way, our cities are dividing out. We're getting this area in the middle of our cities that has the occupants of that, that part of the city have access to just about everything, good public transport, schools, all, all those social facilities, etc. On the fringe, anybody wanting to access that mostly has to climb into a car. And any family out there mostly has to have two cars. And so you're getting this divide in the cities. So that then replicates itself in housing. So in today's newspaper, um, excitement that we, we're again selling more blocks on the fringe than we're sen selling in the central city. Uh, uh, and uh, you sort of ask the question, have you asked yourself what that actually means? It's not the cost of the house and the land package. It's the lost time and what, uh, driving to work. It's the productivity, the double car ownership, the lack of access to facilities, loss of productivity that comes from that locational thing. So in many cases, you'd be better off having an apartment in the city without having to own two cars and with access to just about everything, than having this thing of owning a house in the fringe for the sake of owning a house. The value of that house is mostly going to go down, not up. Uh, so I think we've got a housing crisis, mainly because we're replicating a model that mostly was last productive in about uh, you know, the late, late 1970s, uh, and then the city just got too big, and it's now counterproductive. The one thing I'd do is say, no further. If you haven't subdivided land already for um, development, stop now and come back in on yourself. And I say that because, and I'll give you an example, because we talk about cities and there are a lot of emotional attachments. But in the, in the late 1960s, 70s, when baby boomers hit the university systems, universities expanded uh, to absorb this uh, population. I'm from Zimbabwe, I went to Cape Town University and it's stuck on the side of Table Mountain and it couldn't expand. So it asked a different question. It said, um, how well are we using the stuff we've already got? And what they found is that lecture theatres were being used for 17.5% of the time. There was an underutilization of the infrastructure. So they hardly built anything for the next 40 years. They just re-timetabled. I went back to see that the student numbers trebled and I think there were about three or four buildings that had been built on the whole campus. It retained its character. The difference I noticed is how vibrant it was. It was going from early morning to late at night. Question is, why can't we do that with cities? And the one thing that would enable that to happen is by saying we're not going to take any more land. We're going to come back, we're going to get better utilisation out of our existing infrastructure. The saving in Melbourne, as we go from four to eight million, is $440 billion in infrastructure over 50 years. And that's a figure we worked out with a number of consultants. So imagine that pool of money reinvested in making this a better city. Let's ask ourselves the question, how well are we using the infrastructure we've got? So we've got a schools crisis in Melbourne and in Victoria. I think it's 220 schools need to be built over the next 10 years. And we know it's not going to happen because we haven't got the time or money to do that. So what are the other solutions? Should we be looking at uh, other countries that have hot-seated their schools, that have had two sittings in the same school? Um, how much money does that save? Uh, what does that do to the change in the peak periods in traffic when you've got only half of the students trying to get to school in the morning, not the whole lot? What does that do to help families plan, plan their working day, where you could share that load mostly equitably but amongst two partners who could work different times a day? We might see a whole social change come around from rethinking how schooling could happen. And would teenagers prefer to get up maybe later in the morning and go to school in the afternoon? Possibly so. So I think, you know, we talk about smart cities and we, we then think about technology and 
Uber and uh, Airbnb. They are applying the principle we should be applying to the city. They're getting more out of what's already there. And that, I think, is a key for the future. If we don't do that, we're going to run out of time and money and we're going to divide our cities. Thank you.